English Forward presents. We're going to be chatting to Randy Stuppard. He's a sales closer, a blockchain expert, and a sales trainer. Welcome to the English Forward podcast, Randy. Thank you, Mitch, for inviting me on here. I appreciate it. Uh, I'll change that one thing. I'm, I'm not an expert or a guru by far. I'm, I'm just fairly savvy in it. And I like to say that because there's too many self-proclaimed experts out there that they're not. Well, you modest too, Randy, from what I've read and, and um, the sort of research I've done, but I'll, I'll accept. <laughs> um, you know, just to kick off, um, and find out a little bit about you. Can you tell us where you're from? Where you're based in the world? I'm just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia, and that's the west coast of Canada. What oh, we tend to think of as God's country. Oh, jeez. And I've got a mate that keeps telling me I've got to visit. Well, whenever you come here, you let me know and I'll take you out on the town. Yeah, I'm definitely going to do that. Eh? Um, you know, we, we've got a family that loves the outdoors and um, he just says to me, gee, that's God's country. It's so beautiful and it's got everything that, that we like. So it's definitely on our list to, to you know, places to come and see. If, if you love the outdoors, you can go world-class snow skiing in the morning and go sailing in the afternoon. She said, yeah, the, the, the kids um, and I all love um, kite surfing. And they say the cutting is good too. Oh, it's awesome here. Just when the winds pick up about uh, two, three in the afternoon, they're, they're crazy winds. Yeah, it sounds fantastic, man. Randy, um, you're a sales client, uh, closer for clients that want to scale their business. And you're also involved as a trainer on a day-to-day -day basis. How did you actually start out in the sales world? When it comes down to we, we are... We all are salespeople. We're all selling all the time. I've just happened to hone that craft. Uh, people said I was good at it just naturally, and I went in from there. Okay. Uh, over the years, built many different agencies and companies. And just recently, over the last year or so, I decided to close all that down and just be a sales closer for very particular clients, uh, one of them being Key Difference Media. They... Yeah. They really align with how I think business should be done and they're great to work with. So I love working with them and for training corporations bring me in and I help their sales team just increase their close ratios. I think it's great to be involved um, in, in industries that you can actually choose or to be in that position to have the choice of, of doing something that you love and that you that's going to be true to your identity, actually. So many people don't do this. Oh, they don't. They get stuck in it, and they work their five days, and they're living for the weekend to get drunk and or their two-weeks vacation. And yeah. to me, that's just craziness. She's on the hamster wheel, eh? Oh, yes. And so what is your background in sales? What sort of industry did you specialize in? Well, I've dabbled in so many different ones. When I came out of high school, I had a high-performance off-road shop. We built four-wheel drives that raced up and down the West Coast. That sounds quite cool. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Not a lot of money in it, but a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did uh, networking, computer networking. I, I built one of the first commercial ISPs in Vancouver way back in the day when we used uh, 2400 baud modems get onto the internet. Amazing. So I've been involved with the internet uh, just just a short amount of time, not very long at all. Mm. And yeah, it goes back a bit. Just just a wee bit. And yeah. then the the last two were a boutique networking company where we did a lot of um, very specialized networking on the Windows and Novell platforms. And just recently was a marketing agency, which I decided to close down because I got tired of the deliverables. I just want to talk to people, find out about what their needs and wants are in their business, and then make sure it's a good fit and say, this is what you need. Yeah. Much more fun. Much more fun, much more simple, and it's much truer. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that, that's, that's the, the key. Right? You've only got so many hours to put in, and we might as well doing something that we actually love and uh, we believe in. Yes. So if I were to ask you, who is uh, Randy Stuppard, what would you say to me? 
Well, there, there's always a good question because it's, it's, it's a moving target. Tomorrow, <laughs> I'm, I'm different than yesterday, that I was a year ago, that I was 10 years ago. And who are you today? Who, who am I today? Yeah. I, I, I lean back on my values, and the values is honesty, integrity, uh, having fun, and finding the right people to rub elbows with, like you or Karnica or Rob Toff. I mean, people who emulate the type of things I want to be and want to stay as. So that, that's yeah. really what it is in a nutshell, um, other than experiences. I'm always looking for the next experience that I haven't tried before. Yeah, it's funny, you know, our family motto is um, uh, relationships, experiences. And um, I think if you, if you do that, you find the richness in life and, and you really find the good people. I wrote that down, the, uh, your mantra, memories, relationships, experiences. Yeah. That's exactly. so me. I love it. And, um, you know, it's funny. We've, we've always used it as a compass all through the years. Sue and I have traveled. We've been together a long time, like 30 plus years. And um, we've traveled the world. And um, that's always been the one thing. And it's been wonderful because it just has guided us and, and been great. So what inspires you, uh, Randy? Things that positively change the world. Okay. Uh, I do my small part for it because that's really all I can do. And hopefully people will either look at what I'm saying or doing and maybe some of them actually take up and start moving with it as well. So I can support them. They can support me. That's really what it is. It, it just, I'm always watching for that, seeing what's out there, seeing what's available. And, uh, just sitting back and then contemplating about it. How can I add my little piece of uniqueness to it to make it better? Yeah, that's funny. That's, that's why I actually picked this project to work on, the English Ford project, because that really inspires me to, in some small way, just move it forward a couple of um, inches on the, on the chessboard or whatever it is and, and hopefully make a contribution to you know, help some other people get what they want. So, yeah, that's, that's nice to hear. So we got a lot in common. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. We got a lot in common. It, it certainly sounds like it. Uh, I like to look at it as the two millimeter change. If I can do the two millimeters, that might be enough. Yeah, that's exactly right. Eh? You and me? what you're doing is amazing because you know you've said five percent of the population speaks English natively and twenty percent of the world speaks English sort of. If you could just put that by an extra one percent huge change it's a massive massive change you know it's funny when i talk to people about um, english and education and and what have you we're so fortunate because we grew up in english speaking societies and um gee, you know people that don't they they at such a disadvantage if they don't have the tools to actually learn how to communicate their pay is different their level in society is different the opportunities are different and that really gets me going it's a, it's something that i'm passionate about and want to try and in some little way, it just rectifies as much as I can. Absolutely. I'm behind you 100% on that. Yeah. Do you have any unusual habits or unusual things that you love doing? <laughs> unusual. That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> there, okay. uh... Go ahead. No, go for it. I'm listening. Um... I'm with bated breath here. <laughs> <laughs> the, the most unusual one is... Uh, there's a sport I do called hydrofoiling, and it's a ski with a hydrofoil attached below it, and you're pulled by a boat. There's probably 6,000 of us around the world. It's called an extreme sport, and when, when you get it down, and we call it flying, because when you get your balance down perfectly, it's, you're flying above the waves of the water, and it, it's just smooth and peaceful until you want to go out there and hit it hard by doing gainers or front flips or back flips but till then it's it's so nice to do uh, it sounds amazing you know it's funny you say that we we actually hydrofoil with kites yes and i have um, seen that yeah and um like what's really so we've been doing that a couple of years and what's taking off here 
is um, actually surf foiling. So you paddle into a wave and you pop up on a foil um, and then you actually surf the swell. That's unbelievable. The foil itself was invented by a friend of mine out of California, Mike Murphy. Oh, uh, really? Huh? Yeah, back in uh, the mid-60s. Sure. That's amazing, eh? Mm, yes. What a small world. Do you do that? I do it. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, it's incredible. You know, it's funny. This morning I went down, because my son, Jake, he, um, he's getting really good at it. And I went down and watched him for a couple of minutes before a meeting. You know, in front of our house, there's a, a nice surf break. Um, yes, it's wonderful. It's such a great sport. It's exactly as you say. It's, it's flying. Eh? You feel like you're flying above the, the water. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So how did your passion in blockchain start? I'm a technology guy. Uh, my claim to fame is I was one of the guys who built the uplink facility for DirecTV. And okay. that down in the U.S., they're, uh, uh, DirecTV was part of Hughes Aircraft, so it was a Department of Defense backbone that we got to use, the fiber and that. So anything that's new and exciting that's coming out, I like to know about it to see what kind of changes I can affect back to that whole story. And when I saw Bitcoin come out in 2008, I believe, yeah, I could see maybe what the future could be. And I just kept the tabs on it over the years, a finger here and a finger there and bought some Bitcoin and sold it. I, I should never have sold it, but that's water under the bridge. Yeah. And the possibilities are, are endless. Yeah, they are. So with, with um, the way you help people scale their businesses, that you help companies, how has your previous um, experience equipped you for your current role in doing that? Being that I've owned so many businesses and consulted with so many, uh, most companies don't understand that they really have six companies within their own single company. And the two parts I like to focus on the most are lead generation and sales conversion because that really drives everything else. Without sales, you don't have a business. Mm. And I can take a look at what they're doing and see the simplicity in their complexes, on, on their complexity, and come back to them and go, here are you or one or two or maximum three things that will move the needle the most. Well, that's an art on it. Itself, huh? Pardon me? That's an absolute art in itself. Just being able to, you know, see the wood for the trees, because most people can't. Well, no, because when you're in the forest, all you see are the trees, you no longer see the forest. Yeah. And you need someone outside of it that's not biased to be able to look at it and go, you know, you're missing this opportunity or you're scattered and you know, go in this direction. Yeah, geez, I often need that, eh? just a bit of outside perspective. <laughs> I have three mentors, and I get kicked in the butt all the time. Yeah, exactly. That's 100% right. So what is the most unusual business you've been involved in? I've not really been involved in unusual businesses other than the off-roading one. They've all been pretty, pretty mainstream. I've had some ideas where they, they failed spectacularly. That was you know, a learning experience, but nothing really unusual on the business side at all. And just going back to um, your sort of interest in Bitcoin, I mean, I missed it completely. I, maybe just because of what I do and what have you, but you've obviously got a, um, with your, your background, your, your technical background and, and um, you know, being open and receptive to that whole process. I mean, what, what advice would you have for people that are, that are wanting to learn, that are wanting to, to get involved in what's happening in the technology and what have you. So they don't miss out. Cause I mean, there are lots of people today that are still completely oblivious to what's happening in the blockchain world. Mitch, the, the biggest or one of the biggest issues I find is it's not so much the new technologies that come out because blockchain is amazing. Uh, I'm moving over towards the distributed ledger technology. I'm using that terminology instead of blockchain, but still yeah, yeah. it's 
the lack of curiosity of the world. They're not curious enough. I mean, when you look at most adults, they read one, maybe two books after high school. That's just crazy. Yeah. They're not curious yeah. at all. And that's where we really need to kick them in the butts to be more curious and find out and be empowered to go, I want to learn about something. If I want to learn about it, well, I'm going to rely on myself first. And that'll be a theme for the blockchain talk we're going to be getting into more. I'm going to rely on myself to go out there and find the answers. How, how do you do that? How do you help people become more curious? Oh, no, there's a good question. <laughs> uh, by asking really good questions and not giving them the answers. The quality of our lives are determined by the quality of our questions. Yeah, I think uh, that's that's a great answer. But um, and 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 specifically in in this arena, because we're going to talk about education and and blockchain, as you said. Um, if most people are heads down all the time, and how do you pique their interest in becoming more inquisitive? Like you could ask somebody a question, and they might not actually explore it fully to get the benefit out of the question that you asked them. And the general population is like that. But how could you pique people's interest to actually explore that and, and actually develop an interest? All we can do, you and I, is, uh, is open the door. They still have to walk through. And then each time we put a message out to the market, if it doesn't resonate with them, they're not going to take the next step. And knowing that if we talk to 100 people, <laughs> you know, right off the bat, 33 of them won't like us, 33 are, man, they don't care, and 33 love us. Yeah. So if we focus on just the 33 that love us and try to have the message to pique their interest. So if we have, let's say, off-road guys, for instance, how could it affect what they're doing? Or for kite surfing people, how could it affect what they're doing? Yeah, I think it's, as you said, it's moving that uh, needle just two millimeters, just a little bit, eh, where we can. Absolutely. And so as long as we're out there with different messages to the different markets, we should be able to affect it, the two millimeter change. Yeah. Randy, you're, you're um, quite anti-establishment and you believe that the <laughs> education system is defunct. I want to talk about that a little bit because I think you and I share um, similar views in that. But if you could tell us a little bit about your views and why you feel like that. If we look at any government or institution, like a university or college in them, or a government branch, and look at them as an organism, and what's the first rule of an organism? It's to survive. Yeah. The second rule of an organization is to grow. And if we, the people, don't look at, first off, the governments to go, yeah, that's enough of your growth. Let's pair that back. They'll grow out of control and become the big brother. Yeah. Knowing there is at least, well, I'm going to say 30% of the population that doesn't see anything wrong with that until it's too late. Then they wake up and go, oh, this didn't work. You just have to look back in history for... Venezuela recently, the Soviet Union, Germany, and even farther back into antiquity, as soon as you believe the government's good for you, it turns out it's not. And the universities are the same way. They are growing out of control because they have no responsibility. A student goes into the university, the student gets a loan from the government, they are have to pay the government back. So the university has no skin in the game. They teach the student, here's a piece of paper, send them off on the world. Where's the accountability in that? Mm. Well, I think a lot of it, I mean, you know, a, a lot of um, people that are studying are 
you know, choosing off a menu of courses, maybe because studying something has been put to them as something that they must do or a fallback. That's certainly the, the sort of terminology that um, is bandied around in South Africa, you know, go and get something to fall back on and where it's not actually applicable in the market at all. So they spend a lot of money learning something that is useless. Uh, underwater basket weaving. <laughs> What's that? Underwater basket weaving. Yeah, Something like that. Makes no it's, sense. It's actually crazy because it, it's, it's almost criminal. Um, I agree. Because it's a, it's, it's, it's a fantastic marketing department where they sell courses that lead generally young people that are starting out in their careers down a path that is ultimately a dead end. That's where the universities are failing, but we go back to the two rules. What's the first rule for an organism? Yeah, survive. survive. And the second one is to grow. Yep. And if they're getting essentially free money from the government, they are growing out of control because they have no accountability or responsibility. So how do you believe we can actually reset the clock in universities and have them be what they were intended to be you know, originally? <clears throat> in case, you or the listeners don't know is that universities started off with there were uh, a couple of students or a handful of students who want to learn about something they would find someone who was learned about that and pay them and they'd get taught on what they wanted to know that's where we we should get back to where the students are dictating what they should learn but the professor is also taking cues from business to teach the students what they need to know out in the world. Mm. And, and for those who want to learn more about the arts, there is a place for them too. It'll be the patrons that will be interested in that area. But I don't see the universities too easily giving up their control where no, you must take our courses and we will give you this piece of paper saying you know what you're doing. Yeah, I think it's, you know, we, we've, we've been um, discussing, um, you know, the relationship between an employer and employee and how a blockchain or smart contract could um, create a relationship where the employer ultimately gets a qualified far better employee because they are getting them to learn what is needed in the marketplace and the employee is actually learning something that is useful and is guaranteed of work for x amount of time according to their contract and then the institution that sits in the middle actually delivers what is necessary for that relationship to function in a healthy manner exactly that's simplicity right there that's what we need, the three players working together. Yeah, I think that, that um, it almost goes back to that um, apprentice type situation. I know Germany's big on it, where you go and you know, work for a company for three days and then study for two days. And at the end, you qualified as an apprentice and whatever it is, the automobile industry, and you're guaranteed of three or four years work there. See, that's a brilliant model that we have moved away from. Mm. And I think it mainly because the, the university was pushed so hard because that was typically in the trade area and the trades were looked down on where we need trades, we need university um, educated people, we need all of it and not one is better than the other. But the mm. whole uh, paid internship or getting the apprenticeship those are just brilliant ideas which can be incorporated well into blockchain technology. Yeah, it's funny. My grandmother always used to say to me, if you want to be assured of a job, become a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. We always need plumbing. You're quite right. That's 100% true. It doesn't matter whatever technology you bring in. Everybody's going to need to go to the loo at some point. <laughs> Hey Randy, you know, in, in Canada, what's some student debt like? I know that the figures that come out of the States at 1.5 trillion um, is, is horrific. Is it, is it um, any better? 
No, it's the same. It's the scam being perpetrated upon the students where they come out of their classes, which are typically useless and are 50,000, 100,000, quarter million dollars in debt. Just makes no sense to me at all. Yeah, as we said, it, it just it does seem criminal to start off your career with that hanging over your head. I mean, it's hard oh. enough today for a kid to, or anybody actually, to buy a house. Well, that's where my anti-establishment comes from, where the powers that be want everybody to be in debt. The world runs on debt as a form of control. Yeah. If you're not in debt, they have less control over you and limit and they, can, they can't limit what you're doing. Uh, what some um, people in the States want to do is that if you have debt, they could actually cancel your passport so you can't leave the country. Mm. Yeah, that's not a nice situation to be in. It, it's not. But when we saddle these students with that much debt, it's going to take them 10, 20, 30 years to pay it back because they're going to get married. They're going to have kids. They're going to get a house. They're going to have, you know, buy a car. They'll always be behind the eight ball. Yeah. And I think, you know, ultimately it's going to get to a point where some form of education, because that's what's lacking. I mean, people are going and doing degrees and, and um, learning certain things, doing courses, which don't really have much relevance because of the education that they're getting, whether it's a marketing type um, idea or a, a cultural or a society that's saying, you know, to be successful in a certain society, you need to have this degree or you need to have that. And as soon as that education can change, and people can realize that they do have value by, you know, if you did a trade, you have as much value as somebody that has a, a degree. I mean, would you agree with that? Absolutely. I, I agree with all of it. And going back to what you were saying there, that uh, <clears throat> the piece of paper, businesses no longer care which piece of paper. They're just saying, you need one. Yeah. Where's the value in that? Or, and I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I've met people with MBAs that I've told them, get their mom to get their money back. Yeah. What they were taught has no relevance in the business world today. Yeah. And that's where that ivory tower professor, if we turn back the clock, where they're taking their cues from business to be able to instruct their pupils. Now there's more accountability in all of it. Yeah. Well, I think that's, that's also, it's, it's tying back to um, bringing the, the teachers, the professors, the teacher into the, that accountability equation. Um, and I think with blockchain, you know, as soon as you, you get to where a peer review is real um, and you can review your teacher um, and vice versa, they can, you know, give you a review as a student, you suddenly create a much more honest environment, don't you? The, the, the black hole in that argument, though, is when you fail a student and they leave a bad review. But what about averages? Averages, it, it's so much of a mob rule. And, and that's where we can't, totally go over to technology without the human element. We need some Agreed. sort of that uh, to moderate something. But someone who, and it doesn't have to be one person, it can be a group of people, to look at what's going on and say, that is out of control. Where you might have a, uh, let's say a Ben Shapiro type person who isn't allowed to speak at Berkeley because you have the mob rule saying no. It's no longer uh, demo well, it is democratic because that's mob rule. But if we can look at it where you have people are going, what's best for society? And that's their goal to say, no, we need a voice to be able to say things out we may not like. Yeah. And that's where we have to be careful on the whole review area where on average, it may bring it down enough. But you look at it and they may have banded together 
those students of that professor to say, yeah, we're going to you know, get stop rid of this them. person. From yeah, get rid of them. Yeah. What do, you think be, what do you think would be a fair system? It would have to be a match of the human element and technology. And to have anything that said positive or negative, because we're just not going to allow the positive to go rampant either. There has to be checks and balances for all of it. And a review system of some sort to go, is the professor teaching what he's supposed to be teaching in the way it's supposed to be taught? And that's that fine line. We don't want to go back into the monolithic idea of the university, but we need something like that. And I don't know what it is. I don't have that answer. Yeah, because I, I think, um, you know, you've obviously got the two camps, which is the centralized on the one end of the spectrum and then the decentralized on the other end of the spectrum. And in between, we need to find some sort of a middle ground um, that has the human element in it and the technology right. element to actually get the best result for society as a whole. I believe so, because we don't want to give up our sovereign right to code we want the the humans to be involved in it somehow and once again i don't know and whatever we come up with here's here's the the problem with what we're doing is here's a problem we'll fix the problem we'll forget that we had the problem but we'll look at the new fix because it has problems mm. and we'll get ever closer to a better system but we're gonna have problems all, all the way along. And that's something we have to be aware of, that we'll get less and less problems over time, but there will always be there. Mm, yeah, it's just definitely an evolution. But I think so long as, um, and you can definitely pick it up in society that people are sick and tired of the status quo and they want to move towards something that's better, even though we don't really know what it is. But there's a discontent. And that's always a good starting point because it gets people moving. It's, it's a great place to start. And I think the first step of that is to be self-sovereign. That means using the blockchain or DLT, where you're carrying around your own identity. You have it. And if any government organization or university or whatever else medical system, they need to know something, you have it. They do not. And when you go in and go see your doctor, you can go, oh, what do you need to know? Oh, you only need to know these small pieces. You unlock it for them to know that, that little piece. Yeah, I, I tell you, that, that is going to um, help so much. Actually, on the education side, just on the record-keeping side, for people in developing countries, just, just what you said there now makes such a big difference to their lives. Well, for them, uh, there's a lot of free courses out there by MIT and Harvard and that <clears throat> where they could take the course, pass it, that goes into their own blockchain that they own. And then when a prospective employer says, well, what do you know about this? Oh, I took this course, but you only unlock that one thing for them. I took that course from them and it's been proven that you took it. Mm. They're just not talking out of, the, out of their hat. Mm. Yeah, that'll be a, that's going to be such a big positive for, for people, so especially people that get displaced with famine and um, war and all sorts of other things. You could have a meltdown in the economy, but, but it doesn't matter. You still have your own identity with you at all times. Big plus. I like that. Eh? Big yes. plus. Uh, look at Moldova. They are yeah. implementing blockchain now for their citizens because it was rife with people voting three or four times under dead people's names. They won't be able to do that anymore because when they present <laughs> their blockchain, they'll say, well, no, that person's dead. You can't use that. We know he's dead. Hey, you guys always find a, find a way, don't they? <laughs> oh, they, they try, but this will stop it in its tracks. Yeah. But don't get me wrong, though. Blockchain is, the, the real question behind it is, do we need this solution for that problem, whatever that problem is? Because for most problems, a regular database will work. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's not the solvable. 
I don't want to sound like the snake oil guy, like, oh, yeah, it'll fix that. Oh, it'll, it'll cure your hair loss. It'll cure your lumbago. No. I, I'm, I, I agree with you 100%. And I, I think that's um, certainly where I sit and what I think about is um, the simplicity of something that's really practical and whether it actually applies or it could be done better in, a, in another way. Because those are those are the things to look at. Can it be done faster, uh, cost less, um, provide the security we need? Any of those things that'll make sense. Yeah, because it has got its place, and and I think it'll evolve over time over the next five or ten years to some form of um, very useful tech that um, you know will be adopted in some form. It might not be in our in our current sort of form, but. Um, yeah, to, to actually get critical mass and, and getting, you know, adoption happening. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, what, what would speed this whole process along? There's going to be two areas that I'm, I'm kind of thinking about. And one is business. Yeah. They will typically look at it, look at the cost benefit ratio. And if it makes sense, they're going to do it much like, and of course, the shipping company, um, flies out of my head exactly when I needed yeah. the name, but they did from end to end from manufacturing through the shipping channels to the retail, all based on the blockchain, saved tons of time, cut out lots of middlemen and reduced costs. So that's going to really drive a lot of it because now the government's going to be looking at it and going, well, how can we talk to you? And the business will go, well, this is the way we talk. You'll have to figure that out. The other side will be the consumer pushing for it. But they have, once again, they have to be curious and educated. Much like if we don't like a company, don't buy their products and they'll change their tune. We'll have to buy more of their products to be able to say, this is what we want. And that, that includes universities. If we want them to change, we got to vote with our dollar. Yeah, you're right. But you know, talking about the consumer, if you even if you think about the blockchain environment now, I mean, most people um, just give it lip service as to their understanding of it. People are still really clueless, even people that are involved. And I think, I think, you know, I, I was thinking about, and you obviously have got a much more um, technical background and and can probably, um, you know, give me some good input here, but it's the interface between the consumer and business blockchain, whatever it is that needs to be so easy that people use it intuitively. So they don't even know they're using it, but the costs are less. Um, the, the information is stored, et cetera, et cetera. And just with a simple interface. I mean, how do you see that? The, the interesting part here is the simpler the interface, the more costly it is. Because the programmers have to have to put all the complexity in the background okay. and present a simplified interface for the user. So simpler costs more to implement. It's kind of it's kind of strange, but that's that's the way technology works. But would you get more adoption? So, I mean, more people using it would make it more cost effective. More people would use it. It would be, it saves money over time. It saves money and time over time. Yeah. At, at first, it's going to cost more. Here's the problem. <laughs> Once again, another problem. Yeah. Let's solve it. <laughs> Let's solve it. Uh, when I was doing networks for companies, I would insist on a backup system. Okay. Nine times out of 10, no matter how well I sold it, they'd go, we don't need it until the day they needed it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Now it's like, oh, we need it. Well, it's not there. So when the people don't know something is there and don't know it's there, how, how can we educate them on it? They don't know. And that wasn't the best analogy. It was a better, a better analogy was, would be, you need an IT department. But your computers run so well, you wonder why you need an IT department. Well, it's because it runs so well, the IT department's required. That's a better analogy. Like, it's like insurance, isn't it? Bingo. That's, that's, <laughs> a, that's a great analogy right there. It's like insurance. 
the it's biggest very grudge, Yeah, the biggest grudge purchase out. But man, aren't you grateful you bought it? Well, it, only when you need it. Yeah, that's exactly it. So how do we teach people about the insurance? Talk to anyone on the street. They don't really get how insurance works. Yeah. And we'll yeah, face the right. same thing with blockchain to say, oh, you're using blockchain right now. Like I use Brave browser built on the blockchain. Yeah. Uh, nobody gets it until I show them. Look at all the ads I block. Look at all the trackers that block natively. And they go, oh, okay, that's cool. And you can tell they don't have a clue is built yeah. on the blockchain or why that works. Yeah, well, that, that's a great example because um, it's just something that somebody would use and that get the benefit without having to actually learn all about the tech. Well, I was talking to a number of, I was at a, a conference with accountants and bookkeepers and I got the same type of questions and it was really, a, I went back and went, because they're accountants. Blockchain is just a ledger system that has built-in trust by everybody else. There's no mm -hmm. central authority. There you go. And all the lights came on. Oh, we totally get it now. Now they're interested in doing it. But yeah, there's, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a big jump for people because it's out of their comfort zone. It's a big jump and they don't know how it will affect them. And even when they're using it, they don't know why it works mm. or how it works. Yeah, you know, I, I am on our side of the coin with English Forward. Um, I'm always looking at how we can add value to students um, and users that come onto the platform. And you've got some great ideas on decentralized online education. And and I and I think um, the thing that that always spurs me on is you know when we when I look at South Africa and, and the situation that we've got here, we definitely don't have a level playing field. And I'd imagine it's the same with the world over. So someone from a disadvantaged community definitely doesn't have the same opportunities as someone that comes from a position of privilege or birth or whatever it is because of their access to finance. Um, but an online platform that is accessible to everybody can certainly level the playing field because then it's up to the individual that wants to progress in, in a system like that. Do you have any thoughts on that? I got a lot of thoughts on that. Uh, are, are, are there worth anything? It's the question. It's <laughs> the, there's a lot of courses available online right now. So as long as a student has online access, like internet access, they can get to it at no or low cost. Yeah. But I think the, the issue comes back to how do they prove they took the course and prove that they know what they're talking about. Yeah. When just, just by virtue of being where they are, if it's a little village, just by doing that, they're going to limit their ability to be able to work somewhere unless they can find the business. And here's that other part of that accountability has said, we need these skills and you can be remote to do it. Yeah. How does, how does a student know that? they'll have to take responsibility, go to the company, and they could do a couple of different things. One is ask them, what, what skill set are they looking for? Or two, yeah. volunteer, do the internship or apprenticeship remotely. That's about the only way it's going to work when you're out in a little village somewhere. When you're closer to uh, major mod metropolitan center, the opportunities are way more just because there's more people there. Mm. Yeah, and yet you do hear stories of people that um, even in our current education system have come from very, very um, rural areas and made a tremendous success. And I think that just boils down to the individual at the end of the day. But Look at that, that uh, one kid in his village he read up in books how to build a windmill and now oh, I can so power cool the village. I saw that. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's, it was taking what was available and building it. Yeah. Well, that took a level of ingenuity 
And if you looked at his father, his father was, no, no, I've always farmed this way. I can't farm any other way. But the child continued to push on it. And now he got over on a full ride scholarship over to the U.S. and lots of accolades. Few and far between that person is, though, is the problem. Yeah, that's exactly right. I've got to tell you a funny story, just a, a bit of an aside here, Randy. Okay. You know, I, the, the story of um, the kid with a windmill um, and, and obviously charging batteries and what have you, I think to keep the lions away from their cattle pen at night. So my son and I watched the story and um, he said, man, we've got a pond in the garden, our koi pond, and, and the frogs at night are so noisy. But the only time they're quiet is if the light's gone. So we, we stripped out an old fan and rigged up this little windmill that charged the battery and ran some LED lights at night to keep the frogs quiet. <laughs> oh, oh. Now there is a perfect idea of the ingenuity, the curiosity that we need more of. But you know, there's, there's a kid that was rural that taught us that are urban. We have all the resources around us and yet we saw something and somebody became a teacher that, that in their circumstances you wouldn't actually think was possible. It's, it's a story that needs to be told and something that needs to be impressed upon where the world doesn't owe us anything. And that initial teaching has to come from the parents. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. Eh? I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, just adoption and, and gaining critical mass. And obviously there are lots of challenges with blockchain because of the legacy businesses and maybe a little bit of the pushback from institutions and it will get better over time. But what do you see, you know, what is your view on blockchain adoption and, and how we could actually spread the word faster? If we always keep in mind that people do things generally, um, there is the altruistic part, but generally people do things for themselves. They'll do things that benefit them. If we keep that in mind, we'll get a faster adoption rate. But it has to be back down to those people that we can show how it's going to benefit them. And they'll be the drivers. And for business, it's, it's pretty simple. It's back to a cost-benefit ratio. But the monolithic institutions, universities and government, they're going to be looking at it and going, well, what's benefit to me? I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to have to lay off people. Uh, I want more money coming in. All these things, that, how can we answer those so that we're not just going to go in and disrupt what they're doing with something brand new? So it's going to take time, and it's going to, it's going to be a tomorrow answer because we don't have the answer of our question of today. Yeah, I think that's 100% right, because, you know, I suppose if we start with the end in mind, there are some real problems in society that haven't been solved yet. And if we can focus on solutions to those problems, people will actually adopt it, and they'll get going with it, because it's actually solving something that they need solving. Now, the problem is how it, identify the problem and, the, and have consensus that we've identified the problem and then have consensus of what a, a possible solution would be, in, implement that solution, and then come back and, and ask a very simple question. Did it work? If it worked, continue doing it. If it didn't work, don't do it and remove all the judgment and finger pointing while well, your idea we now look at it with evaluation versus judgment. And we can move much farther ahead faster. But being human beings, we do the, the song and dance with, well, you didn't use my idea, so I'm not gonna be very happy with whatever it is, and it's all your fault when it doesn't work, and I can say I was right. Mm. Do you believe we, we actually, at the crux, we're living through a, like the turning point of, of people's perception and how 
education can be stored and accessed, how you can become a sovereign individual and take back control of your identity and, and your records and the things that are actually important to help you take the next step in life and actually start climbing up the ladder. I, I believe that's the first place to start and not worry about the rest of societal issues. Let's look at that to begin with because everything else can stem from there. Someone needs, uh, they, they become homeless, let's say, but it's because of a traumatic incident or they were fired or whatever it is. Now the smart, the smart contract can trip those government issues agencies because I still I'm a hardcore capitalist but I still believe in a social fabric where now that social fabric can go oh this person needs a helping hand not a handout but a helping hand how can we best help that person so it's no longer a blanket for everybody it's just here's something very specific for you oh look you have these skills proven here's a job yeah. Yeah, you know, it's funny because you, know, you talk about um, capitalism. I'm also a, a capitalist and I, and I think about it, it often in that, you know, if you've been around a little while and you've had some time to build up some capital um, and you, you want to promote that sort of a society, because that's why people are going to study and learn and work and what have you. But it's, it's much harder for people without any capital. Mm. We spoke about young people originally that they come out, they already have massive debt, and then they want to start building up some assets. But how do they actually start to actually build up some assets to become part of that capital or capitalistic system? It's very, very difficult. And and um, you know, maybe with um, education and blockchain, we can actually right some of those wrongs and, and you know, give people some hope and uh, some direction in what they can do. I agree. Absolutely. Uh, Those are really good thoughts in there, Mitch, where when they take the accountability portion of it and they're responsible for it, they can also create their own communities where they can now do micro loans and also go out to the marketplace for micro loans where the smart contracts come into place. Like this is what I, this is what I am going to do. I did it. Uh, and then they go, okay, the, the money changes hand or whatever it is. And then it's because a company said, we need someone that has these, the skill set. Oh, now I got my job. And they can start creating that and give back to the pool of microloans. So now mm. the tide raises all boats. Mm. Yeah, that's exactly right. Eh? We've been giving some thought in education um, and how to actually monetize the learning process um, so people can earn as they, they learn. Um, Brave does that. They use yeah. bat tokens and okay. whether the tokens are worth anything or not is not the issue. It's they're, you're being paid to look at ads. Yeah, that's right. 100% right. I've seen that. Um, and so yeah, if you if you ever come up with any ideas on, on education, I'd love to hear your thoughts because it's it's a uh, it would certainly help a lot of people um, that have got aspirations but very little means, and have got sweat equity that they could actually invest in themselves to better themselves, and help other people in the process by contributing their knowledge to education or whatever it is and elevate themselves in society you know, through the process. Well, let's go back to the original YouTube presence. At that time, there were lots of other streaming services, places that you put up your videos. Yeah. But what they did is they created the partnership program. You put up content, you got paid. Yeah. So they became the 900 pound gorilla. They've now changed that model, but that's neither here nor there but they are the go-to place. Yeah. Other sites are coming up now where you're being paid for your expertise. You would either um, put in coins or put up content and other people would upvote it and you'd be paid because the community saw value in it. Yeah. 
So if someone were to, and I think we're becoming more and more, not a generalized marketplace, but very specialized. If someone were to, let's say they read 10 books on one subject, now they know more than 90% of the world on that one subject. Yeah. They could write one or a dozen papers on it, and they don't have to be very long. But if they have the value showing their expertise and, and showing what people can do with their information, other people find it, they upvote it, they get paid. Yeah. To me, I see that as you know, kicking out one of the pillars for the universities, saying, I'm even being paid for my expertise. Why do I need your piece of paper now? You have to sell yourself to me, not the other way around. Yeah, and it certainly put um, the power back in the hands of a student. It does, and back to their being self-sovereign, they now say, here are the papers I wrote, and look at all the, um, the money I made from it, to say, I know what the heck I'm talking about, because other people said, I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, absolutely. They can now become the professor. Students can come to them and be taught. Now, you know, just that in itself would create a viral message because it it's completely flips what we know on its head. I agree. Uh, you know, you, you have a good way with the words and I love them. I'm going to be, I'm writing down notes here. because I'm gonna be <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, a, it's such an interesting topic, eh, Randy, and I, I um, so excited to be chatting to you, just be part of this whole thing because it's, it's um, you know, there are some problems and, you know, it's guys like you with your contribution that are going to help, you know, set things right. Um, and, and, you know, the thing that really encourages me, there's so many smart people involved in this industry and looking at it from different angles, you know, all over. And it's, it's really, really cool. Well, Mitch, you're part of that. The, the smart people, you're asking the right questions, you're seeing how that directly applies to, you know, that 5%, how can we help them become more self-actualized? I don't like that term, but I'm just yeah. going to use it because everyone seems to agree what it is. Yeah. And that those people who go, yes, I want to be me, and they'll run with it. And you are making sure they're hearing that, they're getting the word. And without yeah. you, that's, that'd be a huge hole in society. So you are bringing a tremendous value to all of this and getting the word out there. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate that, man. It's, it's, um, it's nice to actually be part of something that um, can contribute to the greater good. It's really cool. But um, uh, Randy, we've sort of come to the end of our time. I just want to say thanks, man. It's, it's been great chatting to you. Well, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, allowing me to spew forth my ideas, whether uh, people like them or not. And there's going to be a lot of people who don't, and I'm good with that. Yeah. Uh, but this was great, and I appreciate the, the opportunity to be able to speak with you on it and kind of bat some ideas around. Yeah, it's cool. Listen, I'm going to take you up on coming to Foil in Vancouver. Eh? I tell you, when I tell my kids, they're going to say, where are we going? Where are we going? <laughs> Anytime, you just let me know, and I'll make all the arrangements here. And listen, likewise, we live in a beautiful place. The sea is warm and um, the foiling's great. So it's an open invitation. Whereabouts in South Africa? Uh, we live in a city or a town called Mshlanga, which is about 20 kilometers north of Durban, up the north coast. It's on the east coast. Okay. And um, Yeah, it's lovely. Our, our sort of just going into winter now. And the water today, I think, was 21 or 22 degrees. Oh, it's um, terrible. It's ter yeah. That's way too hot. Way too That's really cold. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but it was, today was an exceptional day. You know, when you get that crystal clean water, um, it was, um, Jake went and foiled on the high tide. And um, it's just a very soft, you take off on a very soft breaking foamy and then the swell kicks up and you can ride it. And um, oh, just so, so, it's such a beautiful time of year here. Really that's brilliant. Mm. Well, I'm going to take you up in your offer. I have backpacked Africa, but I didn't make it down to South Africa. And from what I know is Vancouver, uh, San Francisco, um, Sydney, and Cape Town, they all have the same look and feel. 
mm. because of them being port cities. Mm. So it's definitely a place I want to visit and and just just experience the area. Oh, it sounds good. Well, we look forward to hosting you. All right, Sire. Cool, man. Nice chatting. Nice chatting with you, and hopefully we'll can do it again sometime. Yeah, I'm sure you will. Thanks, Ernie. Keep well. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. You were listening to an English Forward production, the web's largest Learn English community and Q and A site. Everything you need to understand and improve your English. Visit EnglishForward.com.